<laughs> Good afternoon, everyone, um, again, and uh, welcome to the IHR Digital History Seminar, our last one of the year, so I'm very pleased to see a full turnout um, this afternoon for James Baker. Um, many of you will know James Baker. Um, he is one of our conveners, uh, one of our um, star conveners for the um, History Seminar. Um, he is a senior lecturer in Digital History and Digital Humanities. Um, and archives at the University of Sussex, um, and I probably got that wrong, but nonetheless, you get the gist of it. Um, beforehand, um, he was a digital creator at the British Library. Um, he is a member of the, particularly at Sussex, of the Sussex Humanities Lab. Um, he's also a member of the Software Sustainability Institute, and he's involved in a whole range of projects um, at um, Sussex. Um, and he's going to talk to us this afternoon about one of those projects, um, Making African Connections, Decolonial Futures for Colonial Collections. Um, he has also published um, a book, well he's published a, a number of articles, but he's also published his PhD two years ago on the business of satirical prints in late Georgian England. So um, keep an eye out for that. Um, but this afternoon James is going to talk to us about Decolonial Futures for Colonial Metadata, 1838 to the present. Over to you James. Okay, so thank you, Richard. Um, Make African Collections will come later. Um, it won't be the focus of today. Um, I also want to start by saying that um, it's such a pleasure to speak at a seminar which I believe has made a, in its kind of short life, made a really important and sustained contribution um, to historical scholarship. I do say that as a convener, um, but as someone who was a fan before I was. Um, I also want to start with a few caveats that are kind of born out of a simple fact that um, that title really sets me up for a fall. Um, quite enormous fall potentially. Um, and the caveats fall under a couple of headings. Um, the first fall under the heading of what I'm not. I'm not an expert on history of decolonization, I'm not an expert in decolonial theory, I'm not a library archive or museum professional, although I've worked in all three, and by training um, I'm not a historian of the modern or contemporary world, though I'm increasingly getting there. Um, you may well be one of these things, and I'm giving this talk because I welcome your expertise. Um, the second set of caveats fall under the heading of what this paper isn't. Um, this isn't a talk about the history of metadata, a talk on the histories of colonization, whether military, political, social, or cultural, and it isn't a talk based on a single research project or, as of yet, a kind of fully rounded research agenda. These may be the things you came here for, and I am sorry to disappoint, so I will touch on all of them. Instead, I'm a historian um, who, by a combination of professional and personal circumstances, a desire to collaborate and be collaborated with, a little opportunism, and plenty of luck, has stumbled from the history of the printed image in the long 18th century, my doctoral subject and the subject of a recent book, um, into a research space that the joins or fissures maybe between digital curation, history, art history, information theory, and libraries, archives, and museums. And so this paper is really, I guess, about the public history that I'm practicing at those joins and fissures and the rationale behind that practice, and primarily the rationale really behind this paper marks for me the beginning of a very personal um, project that is something I really care about. To bring together various threads of research that I bumped up against, um, that are kind of bumped up against the histories of knowledge organisation. And the absence, as I see it, of that history of knowledge organisation from the systems of knowledge organisation that we've built since the web. For it strikes me that by deprivileging access to knowledge, which is undoubtedly a good thing, um, we've somehow detached knowledge, um, detached knowledge of the histories of knowledge organisation um, from that knowledge. Knowledge that potentially makes um, those knowledges in our um, systems more knowable. And if the histories of knowledge organisation are colonial to some extent in origin, it strikes me then we have to ask questions about how can we begin to decolonise the knowledge that they represent. My position and the work I've been doing around histories of knowledge organization um, is kind of based on the idea that metadata structures reflect ideology, they reflect assumed truths, and so that much of the metadata we encounter in the course of finding stuff in um, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums is colonial in some way. And I come to that position through many, many scholarly depths. Um, I'm inspired by library scholars like Tony Sutherland, and Sophia Amidja-Noble. Um, these slides are already online if you can't quite see the wording. 
Um, critical museologists like Candace Green and Hannah Turner, um, digital humanists like Rika Rissam, historians like Antoinette Burton, art historians like Tammy Odomosu, and architects like Zainab Selick, as well as Emma Perez, Emma Perez and her notion of um, the colonial imaginary, which I'll return to. Now, one thing that kind of unites this literature is power. Um, some of you may have read this book, some of you may have gone to talk at the National Archives last month, month before. I missed it, I couldn't make it. Um, as Noble writes in Algorithms of Oppression, um, those who have the power to design systems, classification or technical, hold the ability to prioritize hierarchical schemes that privilege certain types of information over others. One powerful group in the history of knowledge organization are those who design systems that determine which objects contribute to knowledge. This is basically then selection. And I'm not really gonna talk about selection at all today, um, not least because there's loads of great work on it, but it just seems imperative to note while we're here, that as far as I can see, um, the selection of things to create, um, the selection of things from which we create metadata um, has kind of three flavors of colonial violence that are produced. Um, the first is not collecting. Um, Tonya Sutherland, in particular, in her article on archival amnesty, decries the amnesty she says was given to archivists, sorry, given by archivists to white racists by not collecting evidence of the culture of mid 20th century lynchings. So, photographs, novelty postcards, dismembered body parts. Similar in a coda to uh, his book Thinking Black, um, the historian Rob Walters, who's um, a talk by whom you can see in the stairwell at the moment, I noticed in the way here. Um, he writes, quote, that without the efforts of black activists to archive their struggles, this book would not have been possible. It's they, not state, not the archival establishment that made black futures pass. The second thing to do with selection I just want to highlight is um, amplifying collections that don't need amplifying. Um, Rapika Racine describes NINES, the Network Infrastructure for 19th Century Electronic Scholarship, as perpetuating colonial violence by amplifying already overrepresented authors and not addressing absences in the corpus. Um, in the politics of mass digitization, Nana Bonda Thystrup um, shows how capitalist infrastructures normalize this kind of behavior. And the third kind of selection I want to mention is the building of social technical infrastructures that attract white male heteronormative demographics. Um, Emma Perez is colonial imaginers whose labor reproduces their own interests and their own worldview. Um, many of you will see this graphic um, about Wikipedia produced a few years ago and the work of the folks involved in whose knowledge and the importance of that work really cannot be overstated. But today I promise in my title I'm going to focus around metadata. Um, the stuff about collected stuff um, that Anne Gilliland tells us, quote, um, that cultural heritage and information professionals have been creating for as long as they've been managing collections. She's basically saying that metadata is all that stuff we didn't call metadata before. Gilland also continues uh, to say that metadata is like interest. It accrues over time. Building on this, I'd like to suggest today that by looking at some of the histories of metadata, we find how that accrual um, can also go bad. 1838 is the slightly throwaway title, so throwaway kind of start of the date for my historical period for thinking about um, metadata and um, knowledge organization. Um, it offers a useful hook in the UK, at least as the date for the act of keeping safely the public records. Um, that legislation that created the UK Public Record Office, um, now the National Archives. Now on the surface, this is, if you read the act, is very much a kind of a thing around centralizing the operations of the state and the ways in which they are collected. But it's also legislation that to an extent set the tone for what archives looked like, were meant to be, contained, and hence set a frame of reference for building systems of audit and access through metadata. We can change the country around and we get different dates. If we move to France, the relevant dates are more likely in an archival sense to be 1790 to around 1810, when the Archive National was formed, or indeed, we could say it's somewhere in the 1850s, uh, particularly 1854, when the archivist at the time, Francois Armand Chabrier, um, asserted the separation of archives and state in the Praslin case. Um, this is basically a request from the Minister of State to destroy a bunch of records that might have caused damage to uh, the family of the late Duke de Praslin on the grounds that they might damage the family honor 
um, the archivists rejected the idea they would um, destroy these records and kind of set a precedent around the separation of um, the state um, and the archive. And Jennifer Milligan has a great essay on this um, in Antoinette Burton's book, um, Archival Stories, which came out in 2005. Um, on the Iberian Peninsula, um, if we follow the argument in Paul Sale's history of archival practice, we can move to 1588 um, and Simonancas. Um, and in particular, Philip II of Spain's um, eight-page rule decree that set out the rules for managing the state archives. Now, this is by no means the first early modern decree of its kind that are setting out the rules of state archives, but the first that kind of, in de Sale's argument at least, bear, um, bears clear resemblance to 21st century archival rules for managing archives. The point really is that whichever lens we take, um, and I've chosen sort of three European examples here quite deliberately, um, it's the metadata systems of the global north that become the metadata systems of global professionals. 1838 in England is useful not only as a historically colonial time and place, but because the act of keeping safe of the public records instantiates a logic that connects care with audit, um, that is knowing what is there, the audit required systems of arrangement and description of what is there, the descriptions of what are there, and are produced by some kind of neutral judgment. Um, and that neutral judgment might, might not necessarily include asking questions too much about what isn't there. Now, I mentioned Candace um, Green's work earlier, that museums, of course, tell different stories to archives. Um, Candace Green discusses how histories of metadata are about much more than archaic descriptions outliving their circumstances of production. Rather, she argues they are about whole systems of arrangement, enduring and reproducing. And this is not an especially surprising story in history museums, but it's worth um, highlighting. Um, she's one of the um, anthropological catalogers at the Smithsonian. Um, and she writes in this piece about, to some extent, the history of cataloging at the Smithsonian. And she shows that how in the 1850s, ethnologists, as they were known at the time, um, created structural information about anthropological collections using a ledger system that had been designed for cataloging the Smithsonian's bird collection. So the same ledger was used, the same fields were used, only some fields like nature or sex were ignored when describing um, anthropological collections as opposed to bird collections. Um, as Green writes, as ledger books filled with catalogue records, new books were ordered, but there was little change in format over the span of more than 100 years and 93 volumes. Not until the late 19th century um, does sex disappear and people make an entrance in their anthropology catalogue. So what we have here then are racially inscribed ideas about the proximity of anthropology and zoology, um, creating metadata systems um, that um, structure things around the latter, the, the former, structure things around zoology um, in order to structure the work of the latter. Sobering later in the piece, Green notes that, quote, most systems most of the systems the United States are cataloging anthropological materials can be traced directly or indirectly um, to this practice, leading, she argues, to a devaluation of collection stories and the violence of colonial encounters. Um, categories that are not easily handled by metadata systems made for birds. And one thing she says is that their archival records do show a lot of this. They show a lot of those collection stories, but in order to kind of force that into the metadata structure they created, they couldn't get it in. And so it kind of gets left out and is in the archive and has to be put back in to those records. Worse still, one of the things her paper um, traces is how these inequalities are moved over time. And she shows how they move from page to card, from card to database, from database to online in really interesting ways. So read that. Um, in library lands, the final kind of um, trot through, um, these stories can often be told through people like Nabil Dewey. Um, many of you will know that Dewey published the, his Dewey Decimal Classification System in 1876. As the post-Civil War reconstruction in the United States was coming to an end, um, Mario O'Hara points out that 305.8 is the subdivision for ethnic and national groups. And Dewey's worldview is very much um, uh, reflected in what comes first. So 305.81 is white North Americans. This is in the social science division of the geodesimal system. Um, we then see a specificity of different types of European heritage, so Germanic peoples, Italians, Romanians, etc. And then at 3.5.89, we basically get everyone else. Most of the world are represented in that category, including, if you dig further into that, black North Americans. 
are actually represented in that part of the pathology structure. Now, Dewey's classification system is not used everywhere, of course, but to some extent he is making the world of book classification. And although Dewey has in part been unpicked, I think the most famous part of the unpicking was getting anthropology away from zoology, um, because systems do endure, their prejudices outlive the social situation in which they're created, they refuse to stay in place, and these divisions um, are still in the latest version of Dewey, as of two days ago. These systems of knowledge organisation produced what M. Perez calls white male heteronormative colonial imaginaries, the fictional, fictive pasts produced by unequal archives and unequal archiving. And if the pasts are fictive, so in part the metadata that produces them is. Now, of course, contemporaries would not and did not see it that way. For many contemporaries that I've looked at in the course of my research, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, much metadata produced in these eras was good, real, natural, as it should be. And I should point at this point to um, Borker and Starr's book called Sorting Things Out. It's really interesting on how prevailing categorization systems are perceived as by people as real and their logics internalized. And that's quite a natural kind of human process to some extent, to see those categorizations as real. Um, our task as historians then might be to, um, to see the way in which people are seeing things as normal and natural, um, but they're trying to understand the ways in which maybe they aren't normal or natural. Um, now, the example I've been working on is a subtle example. Um, and if anyone was at UCL the other day, last week, I was going to talk about um, this at length. Um, a slightly more subtle example of the ways you might think about metadata production um, having been colonial inflected. So between um, 1930 and 1954, Mary Dorothy George, who is a historian, wrote 7,000 pages, um, 12,500 catalogue entries, 1.5 million words, and they catalogued for the first time, so attributed, dated, described, all that work of a cataloguing uh, process. They catalogued for the first time the British historical prints published between 1771 and 1832, which are held at the British Museum. Her work, the, and to do with the full title, the Catalogue of Political and Personal Satires Preserved in the Department of Prints and Drawings of the British Museum, um, was very much lauded by contemporaries. Uh, in a review from, um, oh, it's not that page. I don't put it up. Uh, in a review from uh, 1954, the art historian Ernst Gombrich wrote, quote, um, as in her preceding volumes, she has not only carefully described and transcribed the imagery and captions for identification, but she has elucidated their countless topical allusions, listed copies and variants, and supplied a series of indices which have made her work indispensable, the historian of opinion and manners. And before I go further into George, I should say that I have found her in my research on the history of the printed image absolutely indispensable, could never have done that work uh, without what she did first. George's colleagues at the British Museum were equally praiseworthy. Um, and these are just some of the things that come out of the archival records of the British Museum around um, the Department of Prints and Drawings at this time. So she had quite a quiet curatorial footprint, um, which is not unsurprising necessarily of kind of cataloguing labour, and particularly women's labour in this period, which I'll come to. Um, but the reports and memos and minutes produced by the Department of Prints and Drawings over a 24 year period describe George thus, and I kind of put the chronological here. So she is described as thorough and conscientious in 1932, as having worked steadily in 1935, as unremitting in the exacting labour and research in 37, once again as unremitting in 1948, they like that word. Um, they noted the importance and arduousness of her work in 1947, her excellent work in 1948, and her accustomed industry and accumulated learning in 1950. The catalogue was described by colleagues as um, of great erud erudition and having a very good reputation in the learning press and will it be permanent valuable to historical research in 1935, as most valuable historical work in 1939, as of great documentary value to historians in 1939, and as of work of such distinction in 1951. Now, with apologies kind of battering you with some of this praise, um, there's something I want to kind of make a point about this, is that we might expect um, this from the department that are accountable to their superiors for such kind of grandiose language and suggesting her work is so important. Indeed, it is important. And yet, it does stand out within the records as being particularly something that is picked up upon. Uh, I'm not saying the other curators were um, not lavish of quite so much praise, but Dorothy George certainly is by her um, contemporaries in the Department of Prints and Drawings. 
What I've been thinking about, though, is how we might contrast the praise of her contemporaries and towards her work with recent interpretations of some of her prints. Um, this is a print um, called The First Interview, or an envoy from Yarmouth to improve the breed. Um, it's etched by Richard Newton, and um, it's published in 1797. Yes. Um, and what this print um, uh, portrays is something that should be familiar to historians of uh, late Georgian Britain, which is uh, an imagined encounter between Charlotte, Princess Royal, and her fiancé, Frederick, hereditary prince of Württemberg. Um, the latter is central to the sea. He has an enormous, ridiculous, distended stomach, um, which requires a footboy to carry it and a carpenter to adapt a table um, to accommodate it. Now, what George does in her description, um, and this is just a, a subset of her description, um, is connects the first interview um, to reports of the Prince of Württemberg's corpulence, which was much commented on after his arrival in England in November 1796. So she says, the hereditary Prince of Württemberg, enormously corpulent, advances in profile to the left towards the Princess Royal, his stomach supported on the bent back of a servant in livery, and I've removed um, the racist epithet in this instance. And she goes on, and I should say the way these descriptions work is that they tend to have a kind of a physical description in the kind of the first paragraph, and they move on to a separate thing called a curatorial comment later, where she kind of connects it with um, historiography and connects it with um, sort of uh, other secondary literature about the people. So these are very much kind of um, physical descriptions, in a way, if we go back to things like um, using cataloging standards. But she doesn't tell us in this description a number of things. Um, she doesn't tell us that the prince's right leg is positioned in front of the rear leg of, of the footboy. You can see just down here. Um, she doesn't tell us that the prince's groin is pressed directly against the footboy's buttocks. Only that the print, quote, the prince, quote, advances in profile. But these details are really crucial. Um, in her recent book on uh, Africans in caricature, Temio de Musu argues an incredibly astute reading. Um, but the scene here um, really rests on Newton, the, the caricaturist, quote, turning an African footboy into an obscene prop. Now, she drives home this point with respect to the fact um, of the carpet on the right-hand side and the end of what he says. He says at the end of his quotation, I suppose he has some German method, a rare ram this to mend the breed. Now, this only really makes sense if we read the print depicting rape as a graphic, scurrilous and violent response to rumours that the prince was bisexual. And the last bit is, is the rumours of the prince was bisexual, something that is a, is a reading made directly by Temi Odomusu. Now, if, as I think Odomusu is right to argue, this then isn't a satire just on a portly um, new royal prince. And I just say that one of the points of these typical prints is that they did have multiple readings and multiple layers and they're supposed to tap into different sets of knowledges. Um, but even so, if this is one of the central um, points of the print, what are the historical conditions that produced this misleading metadata? What are the, the historical conditions that produced this kind of misleading description that moves us away from a certain type of reading of the print? So first, they're produced by the 1930s. They're produced by class stratification, um, by severely restricted access to higher education, and Dorothy George had a doctorate, um, though the British Museum reports are more like to call her Mrs. Eric George than they are to call her Dr. George. Um, and they are produced by an author who was the archetype of women's labour in this period. Well-to-do, part-time, married but without children, task orientated um, repetitive, clerical, unremitting. Um, and so this is a section from um, the, the, the report that's um, submitted by Campbell Dodgson, the uh, keeper at the time, um, talking about why they want to hire Dorothy George. So Mrs. George is married woman without children, the wife of a portrait painter, and she's described as being a quick and accurate worker. It really fits in this model of um, 1930s um, women's labour. Second, these metadata were produced by Practical Considerations, a state-funded institution in the British Museum. Um, the polite confines of the Department of Prints and Drawings, which is a beautiful room, if any of you have been there, you haven't, I encourage you to go. Um, an academic press, these were published by Oxford University Press. 
and indeed the intended use of the volumes in research libraries. Um, and one of the key intended uses being that there will be research libraries that wouldn't hold the prints themselves. These volumes do not contain the prints, they just contain descriptions. And so there's a need within these descriptions to um, write in such a way that builds a picture of the prints in the mind's eye. So telling us through these descriptions what's in front of us, moving us around the kind of the scene, moving us around the story of the print is a key part. And so this produces, and this, this is the length of this particular description, descriptions that when read are clear, neutral, and confident. I won't read all this out, but I'll read some of it. So where do I get thus far? So we've got to the quote, uh, I was come from Yarmini, etc., etc. Um, the prince's gold-laced embroidered waistcoat has a ribbon, um, and his ribbon contributes to his grotesque appearance. His coat is dotted with stars and borders. Behind a man holds a saw, stands by a table out of which a semicircular piece has been cut, etc., etc. A patterned carpet and picture on the wall complete the design. So this is a kind of a clear, neutral, confident reading of what's in front of Dr. George. Equally, when we start to examine this as a corpus, George's descriptions, um, we see that George's descriptions contain a predominance of words referring to print processes. So words like inscribed, we see at the top with over 7,000 um, instances. The spatial arrangement of the print content, words like left and right are being used to move us around the print when we're reading those descriptions, building a picture in our mind's eye. The kinds of things that are often described, man, hand, head, hat, woman, and actions, stands, says, holding, wearing. Compared to a reference called horror of everyday language, um, we find that George tended not to use past or future tenses. She doesn't use words like was, has, were, said. She doesn't use personal pronouns, I or you. She doesn't use modals, would or could. And she doesn't use informal language, uh, it's not. And I should say, what this is basically is a, it's a set of negative keywords um, used are as uh, comparing the corpus of Dorothy George's text to a standard corpus of English to find the words that are most frequently not used. So basically, Whatever's at the top there was is a word that's most obvious in its absence from the text compared to standard English. Uh, and they are kind of the most, a set of negative keywords. The words that are not in her text that kind of should be if it was um, more normal speech. But whilst this, um, I'll come back to that, whilst this um, clear, neutral, confident voice isn't terribly surprising, I think we can take that from the kind of words that are not being used. It also isn't universal. Um, so we might think, well, this isn't really surprising of cataloging labour that someone would use, would not use kind of er uh, and don't. And they wouldn't use past tenses or future tenses. They wouldn't use should or could or things like that. At the same time, Dorothy George is producing this catalogue. Um, she's working alongside Arthur Popham, who's writing a catalogue of Italian drawings in the print and drawings department of the British Museum. Um, and it's published in 1950. It focuses on establishing provenance and it focuses on making attribution. And as such, what's really interesting about this contemporaneous volume is that unlike George's volumes, it does move between tenses. It is much more interpretive. It says things like because, um, and it does hedge regularly. It uses words like might or could. So although it seems like this is a natural way of doing this kind of labor, contemporaneously to her work, someone else is working on similar collections in the same department, but making some different kind of ways of describing the work in front of them, partly because they have a different um, uh, sort of motive in mind in terms of what they're trying to do. George's tone then we can see is a choice produced by her and the labour conditions in which she worked. So if we return for example to the first interview um, we can start to see how the neutrality worked. So this is a way of just looking at the parts of sentences um, in the description we saw before of the first interview. Um, anything that's kind of spatial is highlighted with the, the empty ones and highlighted as non-spatial the rest. And, what we're doing here is saying a part of a sentence contains sufficient spatial information to make that whole part of a sentence, whatever is between punctuation, um, be categorised that way. And we start to see um, in this and in other examples the ways in which Dorothy George is using spatial language to structure her description. Again, that kind of, um, these are not location words, but they are moving us around the print, creating an idea in our mind's eye of what's going on. Um, she's also in the same print, uh, the same description of that print, teasing out um, various aspects of the characters and their dress, which is a kind of trope of her way of working. So 
Um, the prince set is stout but comely. Um, the prince wears a um, gold laced embroidered waistcoat dotted with stars and orders. And with the carpenter, his face and gestures are expressing alarmed astonishment. In other examples, we see um, the way George's metadata, like the prince, is um, concerned with the actions of principal characters of the day, marginalized by actions of um, marginalizing the combination of different identities and different voices. And her descriptions are also raced. Um, her mind's eye um, directed to terms which are to do with Jewishness, are to do with savages, and those kind of words. And they are also gendered and classed. And I'm not going to explain all of this graph um, produced by my colleague Andrew Solway, um, who is a corpus linguist, um, but I'll kind of try and explain what's going on here. So within the top 300 um, most frequent words that Dorothy George uses are two pairs that have roughly similar meanings. Fat and stout and old and elderly, roughly similar. When we skimmed concordances and we read down the use of these words and looked either side, we started to see that they were associated with well, they were associated with gendered terms and those associations were varied. Um, for statistical purposes, it's worth noting that the word man occurs 2.3 times more frequently than the word woman within the corpus. So if George were using fat and stout interchangeably to describe men and women, then we should expect to see fat man and stout man occurring 2.3 times more often than fat woman and stout woman. Instead, we observe that fat man has 82 occurrences um, and fat woman has 73, um, so only 1.1 times more often. In other words, even taking into account things like that this measure doesn't deal with proper names or professional titles, so parson, lawyer, soldier, etc., and which are more likely attached to men than women. George is using fat to describe men about half as often as she uses it to describe women. We add old and elderly to this, and we find that George seems to have a systematic preference for describing men as stout and elderly and women as fat and old. Linguistically, at a pure linguistic level, this cannot be a function of the prince alone. This is a choice for associating with these words, just like it's a choice not to describe um, the rape of a footboy. So what we find in the case of Dorothy George is that metadata indicates the context of its production. Um, it's suggesting to us things about when it was produced and the language being used. And that our knowledge of that context is deepened by putting back into that metadata the results of archival research into how that metadata is produced, in this case over 24 years of labour. And some of what I like to call sort of soft digital humanities, sort of work that I've been doing that interrogates trends and informs close reading and prompts further archival research. And this really matters um, in the case, I think, of Dorothy George, because since at least the 1960s, George has been a vital interlocutor between us and the past that she described. Framing her labor as the production of colonial metadata reveals whole systems of arrangement, enduring and reproducing. Her descriptions, the metadata we now rely on to search for these prints, are something more than just historically specific. What then is the, to go back to the title of my talk, the decolonial future for this metadata? Um, at present, it's sort of being locked in aspic. Um, there have been adjustments over time as it's moved from a physical printed set of volumes through an online database and eventually into a collection search. Um, some are systematic. So you saw L dot and R dot in one of the previous descriptions. They've been expanded to left and right because that makes it easy to search for the words left and right. Um, some are ad hoc. Um, the phrase, a man of African descent, has been used in one case at least to replace a racial epithet, but this is by no means consistent. And there are some reattributions within um, the corpus as well, where that stuff of print scholarship has been used to find, to argue that different people uh, produced the prints than Dorothy George estimated in those cases where there wasn't any um, clear indication of the print. But aside from this, her work has survived intact as it's moved from book to database to online. And this is another story that I'm, I'm trying to research in, and I'm happy to talk about more if you want, how it's kind of made this journey um, over time. A rule exists um, at the British Museum, which is short of policy not to edit George, um, to complement her and add other descriptions alongside her. And so her metadata is being preserved as colonial history. It's logics, it's racial epithets and all, put into conversation with reinterpretation.
so these histories of metadata production um, and the production of metadata histories are informing the kind of public history practice that I'm working on at the moment. Um, I'm a co-investigator on a two-year AHRC project called Making African Connections, Decolonial Futures for Colonial Collections, hence that bit of the title. Um, we started in January, um, we're running for two years, and we're researching historic African collections in South Coast museums um, with the aim of furthering conceptual and applied debates over decolonizing public institutions. We focus on three collections assembled between 1890 and 1940, whose journeys to South Coast museums, so um, Brighton Museum and Art Gallery, which is in Brighton, um, the Royal Eng Engineers Museum in Gillingham, and the Powcotton Museum in Birchington in Kent. Um, all have collections whose journeys to them began with military, missionary, or ethnographic encounters in Botswana, Sudan, and the Namibia Angola borderlands. Um, our partners in this project extend to the University of Namibia, Botswana National Museum, Karma Third Memorial Museum in Botswana, and Brighton and Hove Black History. And I should say, alongside the kind of website bits, we are creating exhibitions, we're making international loans, and we're doing um, various outreach work. Um, this isn't led by me, this is led by a, a geographer, Joanne McGregor at Sussex, and I'm really managing the digital component of the project, which is much more than making a website. It's imaging, it's cataloguing, it's metadata wrangling, it's rights clearances, it's digital preservation, it's a Wikimedia and residence program, all informed um, by the intellectual agendas of the project. And given everything I've said today, um, one question has haunted me ever since I read it. Um, Rupika Rassam uh, writes in New Digital Worlds, and this came out around the time we started Headways Horton. Um, if the archive itself is a, is a technology of colonialism, can the creation of new archives resist reinscribing its violence? Now, I'm not sure that it can, but it seems to me an ethical imperative to try. Um, so what I'm going to do for the, kind of, the end of this is really talk about some of the work that we're doing, um, have been doing on making African connections. Um, and as I said, we've been going since January, our website's available, it's a very soft launch, so be nice. We are gradually adapting it as we're going. So we're trying to make explicit the amplification of um, colonial um, violence through um, metadata produced at the time. Zainab Selik um, argues that we remake canons, in her case, the canon of our history, um, in the case here, the canon of knowledge organization, not by adding to the canon, not by just adding more things to it that should be there, which we've left out before, but rather by creating conversations, dialogue, and reputation within the canon. So in our presentation of records, descriptions are dated and given authors, and we'll continue to do this through the course of our work. Where we have them, um, items are and will be connected to things like catalogue cards and old web archiving projects that have since gone defunct which we also present as items, thereby flattening the hierarchies between these things and making metadata into an object of historical inquiry, in this case, a catalog card uh, and a dead website. And alongside old metadata, we're making new metadata. Reactions to objects uh, when I exhibit and install, um, descriptions produced by curatorial and community labor. We made a conscious decision to use Dublin Core as a metadata schema. Um, it felt like this fitted with our, um, our approach because it gives us a flat structure that makes joins to different collection items and cataloging histories. The central feature of Dublin Core um, is that all elements are repeatable and optional, which we see as a really good fit for producing metadata that's multivocal and that resists the assumptions of the global north. So that not everything has a title, not everything has a creator. Dublin Core gives us a way to foreground and I should say that um, this is really in the absence of being able to create um, community um, instituted hierarchies that we're making a flat hierarchy of this sort. Um, and I should also say that there's, a, there's a, a part of me that feels that using something like Dublin Core, which links to things like Linked Open Data quite easily, is somewhat techno solutionist. And I can feel a bit, a bit bad about that sometimes. Um, and it can sort of play into that trend by using open, uh, by using the data things of ignoring the expertise of people in GLAMS and um, uh, Filestrup's book on the history of um, mass digitization is really interesting on this topic. We've adopted a healthy skepticism towards control vocabularies. Doesn't mean we're ignoring them. Um, inspired by a few things. Um, inspired by Candace Green, once again, 
and a small kind of snippet in her article where she talks about how controlled vocabularies when done badly is really a solution for the search functionality of the 1970s. The point really is that search in the 70s required on exact precision and not the fuzziness that we have today and that the controlled vocabularies fitted that nicely. Um, but, but we don't really need them anymore if we have search that actually is much more fuzzy than those of the 70s. And also inspired by things like Homosaurus. Um, the sauri that are resisting the limits of vocabulary produced in white male heteronormative colonial imaginings. As with many digital humanities projects, I finally said that word, um, we're building our infrastructure on Omica, in particular Omica S. Um, and this fits with what we're doing is a content management and web exhibition platform that is responsibly owned, community supported, open source and mobile first, which is really important for us. And this links into the next point, which we are taking lots of photos of things rather than making 3D models of things. And that's something that came in our peer review, actually. Why are you making 3D models? We're like, well, 3D models aren't very accessible for a mobile device. Um, we want to make accessible images um, to these collections. Mindful as we are of the resource limitations of potential users and of things like uh, minimal computing advocacy. Um, and this is a, a Sudanese tambura. Um, and we're trying to, although the resolution has gone, as I put this on the slide here, um, we're trying to use sort of multiple photography as a way of focusing on parts of the objects and giving um, people a way into those objects. We are not open access by default. And some of you who know me might take that as a surprise. Um, we take the view that copyright is a product of colonialism. And whilst assigning copyright of an object, sorry, of a photo of an object to the current collecting institution is an awkward compromise. And that's what we are doing at the moment. There is also potential for harm in unthinkingly making open representations of objects produced outside of our legal frameworks. And in particular, when those objects, um, we don't know much about those objects, or if those objects have some kind of script on them that we don't, we can't transcribe or figure out exactly what it says. If we don't know what it says, then why are we making that openly available? And so alongside engaging with the literature on this subject, um, including um, Harry Schroeder's really great article um, to do with Coptic um, um, heritage and the, the challenges of making that openly available, um, we are working with, I think, one of the best Wikimedians around to help us balance access and privacy. We're collecting our work, um, our practice, our logics, and making them um, known and knowable. Um, in short, we're making our processes available as much as possible. Um, and think that by being open and transparent what we're doing, it creates a history of the project, which enables people later on to see what it is, that, the choices that we made, why we made them, and critique some of those choices more easily. So we are doing many things to think about the futures for our metadata. Um, and in conclusion, I really want to address um, the question, um, why is this the work of the historian? Because I get asked this in terms of why am I a co-I in a project where I'm helping build websites, design metadata structures, think about digital preservation practices. For me, there is a side to this which inevitably and sadly is practice informs book projects. But the work also feels to me somewhat imperative. Um, doing digital history, working at the joins and fissures between digital curation, history, art history, information theory, and libraries, archives, and museums has brought me closer to questions of coloniality than any other aspect of my educational research had done before I did digital history. Of course, one or two voices from my pre-digital history days have resonated and resurfaced throughout. Um, Edward Said is the obvious one, but um, also Dipin Strakobati and the notions that historian, his notion, historians need to um, provincialize Europe. And I've been thinking about this idea a lot, the idea that we need think about Europe as a province. So this book comes from 2000, um, I put it out in seven, but the original is 2000, that was a terror giving me the, the wrong reference I cited, I brought down the later edition. And he writes, history is the aim to displace a hyper-real Europe from the centre towards which all historical imagination currently gravitates will have to seek out relentlessly. This connection between violence and idealism lies the heart of the process by which the narratives of citizenship and modernity come to find a natural home in history. This idea of hyper-real Europe, I think, is the one that has always stuck with me. Chakrabarti feels like he's speaking to me, the digital historian, doing public history stuff much more than he's speaking to me, the historian who writes books. Um, not that I intend to ignore him when I write publications, particularly in the area of things like the history of knowledge organisation. 
I think this is because treating the production of metadata as a historical subject makes clear that this province called Europe still organizes much of the world's knowledge. Not just in a physical stuff that could, should, must be repatriated sense, or in a kind of stuff that wasn't collected sense. And not just in a buildings or legal structures that have been around since the 1830s or earlier sense. But in a much more pervasive, quiet, violent, enduring and reproducing sense that has and continues to underpin our engagement with the past and has been accelerated by making selections of that past into data. I'll leave it there, six o'clock. Thank you very much, James. I'm sure that fascinating talk will engender um, a number of questions and some interesting discussion. Um, and we've got uh, a fair bit of time for that. So I'll pass over to anyone who has any Questions. Uh, I really enjoyed that, James. Um, the question I'd like to ask is how do you ensure that modern prejudices um, are not incorporated into metadata now when designing and making, say, for instance, African, African connections? Uh, not only in the knowledge you do have and use, but in the absence of knowledge which you don't have and can't use. Um, and is that through partner organisations you're really working with? Or do you feel that by being open and transparent, as you said, and recording your processes, if, if nothing else, you have a safeguard to go against them? Thank you. Um, well, you can't, I think it's the first thing. Um, I think the partnerships thing is perhaps where, when this project's been conceived and when it's being submitted to a research council to, to get some funding, I think the partnerships is the thing that comes front and centre in that. Um, it, it's the kind of the we are working with these organisations, we are working with a, a community that can support our understanding of these collections and working with partners in the UK as well who are open about changing the way they think about the objects that they have. Um, I think that's front and centre, but I think what's interesting to me is that the knock-on effect of that should logically then be how we think about how we construct everything we do from that point onwards, including the digital archive. Um, and for me, the piece about documentation becomes crucial because um, what I want to achieve through the documentation is that it's in comparison to me trying to look at Dorothy George, where I'm trying to reconstruct fragments of a labor process to understand how someone was working and why they made, might have made decisions they did and why they were using certain languages and if I can kind of get into that. I'm hoping the way the documentation I've produced will produce at least, well, James and this team were thinking this way at this time, or at least they're how they're publicly saying they're thinking this way at this time. And we can hopefully infer something meaningful from that when we're looking back at their decisions. Um, the documentation also, of course, about things like, like preservation, those logic, those kind of those important things you have to build into a project to give it longevity. But what I imagine is that at some point in the future, that website will exist, those photos will exist, the descriptions you made them will exist, and a whole bunch of things that describe our process will be alongside them. And that someone then accessing those images in some way will find all that material together, and that they'll be bound together in such a way that, although people will go straight to the amazing pictures of wonderful objects that we're, we're taking photographs of. Um, they might also on the way want to check in with what we were saying we were trying to achieve at a particular point in time. So for me, that, that's really crucial to how the part of the project I'm working on, though it flows, I think, from the partnership work that is kind of foregrounded within the project description and how it's set up. Thank you, James. Um, I was really interested in what you said about controlled vocabularies and uh, the legacy of 1970s search terms. Um, so. Ontological systems and organization systems, however flawed they may be, exist because they serve a, a purpose, because they help people find things. Mm -hmm. um, could you speak a little bit more, because I was a little bit unclear about the how full text searching, we kind of solved that problem, or are you talking about a different type of controlled vocabulary, more expansive and documented one? Could you just talk a little bit more about that? Okay, so what I, I'm going to rely on kind of screen. So what she talks about is that there are a number of fields where control vocabulary was chosen that um, remove complexity. Um, and that complexity might be in different types of things being merged into a category. It might be different types of ways things are expressed in terms of their spelling, for example, or the um, Latin scriptization of those spellings, um, and how they have been sort of bundled together in order to make search easier. And, are, and it's a little snippet in there that's just saying, well, because these systems were 70s databases, they were quite crude and one needed to be able to have really precise terms to call back all the things which were relevant. Um, I think the point really is that um, 
I still think the trial vocabularies are important, and I still think um, having ontologies is important, and I still think that um, a principle that we would say, I mean, I was talking to some of the British Museum about this recently, saying, well, you know, we, we try not to call it a pointer a pointer, we call it a dog. Um, unless it happens to be that the collection that we're describing is entirely about dogs, and then we're differentiating the type of dog. Um, and so you would, and that makes the search easier because people find dogs and they find that what is in there is a particular type of dog. Um, and you could express that as an ontology where you've got dog at the top and a bunch of different types of words of dog. Um, what we're trying to do is what I'm trying to take from um, that example and the example of Homosaurus is just to be skeptical about starting a project with let's define a load of control vocabularies. Um, what we're trying to do is um, we are trying to um, think about some of the ways things are described and thinking very carefully about some of the, the historical terms that have been used to describe collections, whether they remain appropriate, and choose different vocabulary as appropriate. Um, but we're not starting with a list of this is how we describe these things in this collection. Um, we're instead starting with a we know we need to think carefully about how people find stuff. We want to enable people to be able to find stuff. Um, but we don't want to impose a set of ideas onto the collection until we spend time with them. Um, and that, in theory at least, some of the ways in which search is moving um, will hopefully, but you know, the way in which search is moving suggests that, that search is kind of getting fuzzier and fuzzier and pulling us back things that are slightly different to the thing that we asked. And that is a, is a, is a function of the types of um, search engines that we have. Um, and I'm not just saying Google here, I mean in terms of how that um, those types of search are trickling into some of the, the services that we have. So Omica is pretty fuzzy in the way it searches. Um, it is literal at some level, but you can make it relatively like find other stuff that's kind of similar. Um, so that's kind of how we're thinking, which is that we don't need to impose those things. But I just found that story really kind of striking when I read it, because I've never thought of it that way, that maybe control vocabularies aligned with technology, and technology may be kind of half-imposed control vocabularies a little bit, if not entirely. Um, so that just stuck Yes. Um, could you talk a little bit more about how you think people or how how Dorothy Jobs' work then should be approached? Now? So on the one hand, you're saying, of course, it's been indispensable to your work and it's done its reference work, and that's how the British Library still treats it, right? But then at the same time, it becomes a historical record, and you're making a lot larger point. So should you still have her collection as it is, with a kind of explanation or with reference to kind of you know the limitations and the particular prejudices and so on or how should they really treat this now is it now a historical record is it still a reference work uh, how should we think about it or enter it or, or how should people be made aware of it so Jodie George's work is amazing and I think we will continue to rely on it for a long time um, I'm sure it will comfortably reach the 100th anniversary of the publication of volume six in 2035 um, Should it be left as it is? Um, the British Museum um, currently have um, text underneath the physical description that says it comes from this catalogue. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, they are starting to use a vocabulary that what they have in the collection of the line is based on Dorothy George because there is some slight editing that has gone on over said and slight editing that is still happening with some collections in particular where they may have problematic attributions. Um, I don't think necessarily we should load onto the search interfaces that users use to find things with all these like claxons and warnings. Um, nobody wants that, right? You know, we want to be able to, we want to encourage people to find things, not just make them feel immediately, oh my God, this is wrong. Um, this description, they're, they're saying their description is faulty. Um, what I'm interested in is that relationship between continuing to be like stake authority in a kind of clear, this is true sense, and starting to find ways of signaling, maybe, that this comes from a particular place. And I think that does that, for example, by just connecting a description with an attribution gives us a way of saying, OK, this came from this person who has got a citation. It's not just what the British Museum thinks right now. Um, and it fits really with one of the wider ambitions of the Curatorial Voice Project, which um, is where the work of Dorothy George is coming from. So what we've been doing. Um, in that project is looking at Dorothy George as a case study of thinking about the voices of curators and how we can look at them as corpora and say, well, what kind of character does that voice have? And how, what aspects of that character are important and meaningful to, um, to, uh, to kind of 
uh, to write about so that other people using those collections might know about. And it started with me um, having used Dorothy George for many years, um, but also using the British Museum catalogue for other things. And just finding that if you search in the British Museum catalogue, you find Dorothy George very quickly because she wrote a lot, which curators don't have that much time to do it now. 24 years of like persistent labour by one person doing nothing else pretty much is amazing. Um, and the, the types of language she used had a particular way of expressing themselves, which felt mutual and confident, which means I was getting to them through the search terms I was using. Um, and what interested me then is that this is one collection of 1.5 million words bundled together with everything else. And everything else isn't Dorothy George. And everything else you would find for different reasons, through different vocabularies, and different types of choices of people over time doing particular types of labor and work. Um, and it made me think, well, is there a case for thinking about how those joined, those joined up collections of things like the British Museum collections online are amazing resources, um, but at the same time contain these little islands of stuff. And I want to kind of focus on those islands of stuff and say, well, if this is an island, how do we describe that island? How do we think about that island? Is it worth thinking about a future where we change some of the ways in which we describe or present information online that it makes it very clear that this comes from this island over here and this comes from this island over here? And it's partly about that kind of, we are moving, there's a kind of entropy towards basically shoving everything together, um, which really interests me. And so it's that, well, I know that Dorothy George has a set of quirks. One of the reasons this started, because I know she's incredibly squeamish with psychology. She hates describing asses and like posteriors, and she's incredibly polite. It's really interesting just how polite she is. Um, and that kind of started one of my threads of thought. And so if she's so polite about that, a curator now when be so polite might use different sets of vocabularies. You're probably not going to find a load of printed out bums, but you're not going to think I'll use posteriors as the word to find them, unless you know Dorothy George, unless you know the kind of labour circumstances she was working in. So something about the fact that they've been all thrown together made me think that an outcome of this could be okay. Well, if this is distinctive enough, what other collections have islands that are equally distinctive that we can look at and then say, is there a case for thinking about these islands in a kind of um, in a in a way that starts to tease out some of their particularity? Um, I don't have a solution yet, but this project is sort of starting to get to a point where we're talking to other people about these things and saying, well. Are there other islands we can work with? Are there things we can start testing our methods on to reproduce ways in which we can see that this over here is very different to this over here? And it may be produced by totally different institutional circumstances or times they're produced, but is there something interesting about that that we should consider when um, our users come to use those interfaces when at the kind of more advanced level, perhaps, in kind of that initial kind of search or collection that we've used before? The slightly rambling answer. So um, I'm not heading up the work on making up connections to do with teasing up provenance, but that's a key part of what we're doing. Um, the, particularly the collections at the Powell Cotton Museum, um, there is provenance in their archives, um, but that provenance isn't clear within how they are currently catalogued. Um, there are the diaries which um, the Powell Cotton sisters um, produced um, whilst in um, Angola in 1937 in particular, um, which describe particular encounters, they, and they have, again, go back to the sort of voices, they have kind of languages of describing encounters where things are being changed to salt, which are quite interesting. And my colleagues who are working on this project, Tigran Nikostalianu, who is our um, research associate, um, doctoral research associate, um, she's working, she's full time on the project, and working through those, those kind of collection stories. Um, and what we're interested in is then joining that, say, diary entries there with then the catalog, card catalog entry that the Powell Coffins made when they came back to England. And then connecting that with another one done later, say, in the 1960s when someone else had to recatalog the collections and trying to make those joins between them. Because I guess a lot of those encounters get lost along the way. Um, and, I, it's, and I don't think, though, I, I don't know because I'm not, in, I'm not on that side of the project at the moment, I don't think that's to do with necessarily sort of dogmatic schemas being used about you know, how you would describe birds. 
specifically used in, as a way of cataloging things and therefore that wasn't included because there wasn't a field that said how was it selected. Um, but certainly the Palcott Museum is known as an institution that has both anthropological collections and zoological collections. Um, and the relationship between those two is really important to think about natural and anthropological collections. So yeah, good question. Um, and certainly something we want to surface as much as possible when we find those examples of the source of the museum. Um, can you give me a sense of who um, your impact audiences are here. Do you expect this to influence the way that um, the book writing historian does his or her research and thinks about their material? Do you think this is something that's supposed to change the way that um, African communities think about the objects that have gone overseas? Like, who, who are your stakeholders, so to speak, in terms of how this project might shape the future? Um, I think one of the key one of the key stakeholders is um, in terms of how it shapes the future is our is our museum partners. I think um, the on the Make African Connections project, one of the central themes of what the connections are is not geography. These things are kind of logically logically distributed in a sense around Africa. Um, we're very clear the connection is the fact that they made that journey to museums in South of England. And those museums happen to be small museums. Um, and those museums have different pressures. Um, they have um, different um, ways of working um, than the larger um, museums in the UK, which often dominate policy agendas around what to do with these kind of collections. Um, so our partners are in the UK are central to um, them being on board is central to them thinking about how those collections get redescribed and how they then resonate through their kind of channels of pushing things outward. The, the digital archive is being produced in a way not necessarily to be a um, to, to be a, a to be a resource that's produced and last after the project, but also to um, to try and work between those collections in some meaningful way and produce something that is used. But I, I'm. I'm, I'm never going to imagine that people are going to more likely to find those collections, say, digitised at Brighton Hood Museums on our site as they are going to on to the Brighton Museum, um, because they have a more established presence, they are an established museum, they have large collections of various kinds, and people will know those collections are exist there, and if they know they exist, will go there. Um, so we're kind of a, a side thing that's going on, which is kind of trying to do slightly different things with the information, and slightly different things about how those are represented. The second part really is the, the Wikimedia residence work, which doesn't kick in for another five or six months in earnest. Um, but the Wikimedia residence work is um, particularly geared around um, reaching communities um, in the UK who are interested in these objects. But for a Wikimedian who, um, whose work is um, connected with working with communities of Wikimedians in Africa. Um, so Kelly Foster, who's been here, that spoke at this seminar. Um, with the working we are working with. Um, and she's very much going to just take that work in the direction um, that she sees fit. Um, the interesting sort of um, tension here is between not being open by default and Wikimedia. Um, and what's really interesting to me about that is that um, Kelly's really interested in putting out some of the collections, obviously, Wikimedia, that is an output of working with the Wikimedia residents, but thinking carefully about which ones we choose, thinking carefully about which objects are. Um, are unseen already and I don't need more amplification, thinking carefully about which items are inappropriate for making available on a platform that kind. Um, given that, Wikimedia does give things that amplification which will go way, way beyond anything that we're going to produce for our website or that Bright Museums might produce for their website or any of our partners might produce. Um, so we're treating that outlet sort of with real caution, I think, um, because we know once we put things there that they are out of our hands in a, in a kind of good way. We have to choose carefully which things we let go um, with all of our partners and stakeholders. Does that answer your question? Well, so who's going to take up the next research project related to this? Is it going to be another person like you, or do you see it as being somebody more in the museum sector or somebody in a completely different field altogether? Who's going to cite you? <laughs> <laughs> um, it depends. Okay, I mean, I've talked about lots of things today, and it depends which part of the work, right? So, with the, so I presume you're talking about making African connections, right? Primarily, 
mean, that, that's coming out of cultural geography and sort of museology. So that will be the main kind of citation area in which that, that work is, um, uh, is going to resonate through. Um, and we're trying carefully to ensure that we're not going to just publish in venues that people who work in museums are never going to see. Um, so that's kind of, that's an audience there, um, an intellectual audience. But I would hope that parts of this could resonate through how sort of that kind of digital public history stuff that I'm doing here gets produced. Um, and the fact that we are going to try and have real statements of um, purpose and statements of where our intellectual kind of thinking comes from within what we construct, not there at the moment, um, have statements around how we've gone about producing this labour that produced these, these representations of physical objects. Um, and that they are things that we hope will provide models that people might either like or dislike. And if they dislike them, fine. If they like them, fine. Um, but we're trying to just be, not just say, hey, we built a website, it's going to get published on month 23, but on week three, we built a website, and here's some stuff on it, and we are gradually moving through that stuff and gradually posting that stuff and gradually showing you what we're trying to do through this process. And you might not be there for any of the journey and probably won't use it often at all, but our journey will be there through that process. And other people may be doing similar work with similar collections, I hope, um, will find something to kind of um, to kind of riff on, I guess, about what we're doing. Um, yeah, okay. so, so maybe following on from that, um, and Liz, if you want to comment further on um, differences and overlaps between libraries, archives, and museums. I can think about, and I know a bit about libraries and archives and what different do, what archives do, uh, particularly mess data and see complex mess data and working around that. And doing it from a, a, a non non atmospheric viewpoint as well if it was tempting to see. Um, but I'm just curious about your comments of are there real distinctions, structural distinctions between those domains and sort of what the museum's doing and is what you're doing away into the works across all that is that is that leading to sort of a part through those different approaches. Thank you. Um, in terms of museums, um, I guess the key thing I'm taking from the musicological literature is that how mu how museum professionals see themselves is different, is that they see every object that they have as you and so there may be two very similar objects in two institutions, but they will be seen as totally unique objects, um, which is, apart from in sort of special collections land, is not really how libraries work. Um, and I, archives, of course, their collections are seen unique as well, um, but seen more within a, an archival continuum of how, sort of, um, from the fonds down, so it's reduced. Um, so there's something there about particularity um, that is really interesting in this. Um, in terms of working across and between them, um, Part of, my, part of my approach to working across and between them really comes from working with students um, and observing the extent to which they're incredulous that there is a, a, a distinction between these things. And kind of like, well, it's all just stuff from the past, right? Um, and then kind of working with them through some of the histories of those professional areas to understand the ways in which the archives or library collections or the museum collections that they use in their work have been produced by different sets of institutional labors and cultural practices as a way of thinking about, well, they are produced from different places, um, but are seemingly, I mean, my observation is that there's there's pressure between how their disciplines um, define themselves as different um, in the sense of collections being put together and collections being merged and more genericized systems being used to describe those kind of collections. Um, within the Powell Cotton Museum, for example, they, they do have an archive and they do have archival ways of working with that archive as opposed to museum, but it isn't part of the kind of the core way in which they catalog things. Um, and so we're teasing out parts of the archive almost as museum objects and saying, well, this card, and this card catalog, we're just seeing this as almost like a, a museum object and saying, right, this, this card was written by one of the power cons at a particular moment, has a beautiful drawing on it of one of the objects um, and includes a description of some kind. And we kind of treat them that way because we're working in the frame of museums. Um, but if we were working in a different frame, I think we'd work with those different um, but yeah, thinking and particularly just because one of the things I'm trying to do at the moment, as I said right at the beginning, is think about some of the history of knowledge organisation. Um, and there are obviously very classical distinctions between the ways in which um, those different groups work. 
the Dorothy George example throws up a, a really nice example of this in a way, in that she is um, working in a department in a museum that's kind of a bit more gallery than museum -y. Um, she's working on curators who I think are a bit more kind of flannery in the way in which they see curatorial labour and yet she's basically a cataloguer but not called a cataloguer but she's more than a cataloguer, she's much more because she produces descriptions of the front of the books and she produces one of the indices and she's clearly a, a great erudition and writes historical books about these materials afterwards but you could boil down her entries as being just catalogue entries to some extent, which is slightly different in a way from a kind of like a different part of kind of museum labour and just sort of museum labour. So even within those kind of distinctions, I'm really interested in the, kind of the granularity of parts within it, um, which doesn't really answer your question. Yeah, it's just an interesting space to sort of think about this. Can I use this as a moment to ask who has come from a museum, a library, or an archive? They might have museum people in the room who could answer that question. We have time for a few more questions, one or two, certainly, if anyone has any. Um, as chair, I'll, I'll um, take an opportunity. Um, <coughs> I'm just wondering if you might say a little bit about more, in some ways this follows on a bit from Adam's question, about the, the reception from your museum partners, and particularly thinking about how they understand their catalogue, how they use the catalogue, and what they might do with some of the things, some of the materials, and some of the kind of the questions, and the should we say revised catalog entries and um, interpretations that you're doing, and how does how does that process work, and how was that? Where do you see it ending up in that sense? Uh, in terms of process, the process works is that we hired someone that they would trust, <laughs> um, who is at the Royal Engineers Museum today, rewriting some catalog entries for their collections. Um, where Engineers Museum is an interesting example within our project because um, they are an engineer of the Royal Engineers um, and they have unsurprisingly collections that they have because of military violence um, and collections which are interestingly described as a result of that and interestingly displayed as a result of that. Um, but all three partner museums that work in the UK are very interested and open, um, not just because we're saying, hey, we can do some stuff, we're bringing money, because there is a part of that which is like certainly in some some of the examples that we're working with where you know just having some time for someone to do some work um, is something that they incredibly they, they value. Um, <coughs> but they're certainly open to the reinterpretation. Um, they're open to the fact that there'll be exhibits based on that reinterpretation in their own spaces. Um, and they're open to the idea of showing the ways in which, at least within the, the digital archive that we're creating outside of their own system, showing the ways in which um, different descriptions have been made of the same objects at different times. Um, um, and that they see that as, as uh, that collection history and collection description history as being something that they think should be there um, as part of how the works have been produced. Now we're very early on the project and we may start putting this online and then we start to find that actually that's when really the kind of the, the kind of the meaty discussions start happening because we are at a stage of we've gone through the planning stage now we've gone through the starting to digitize we're starting to work towards the first kind of dump of stuff sometime middle of next month and then we will sit there and look at it and go are we happy with this is anyone uncomfortable with this and start to talk about how we might change it in ways that still fit the ethos of the project um, but that might resolve any issues that we have um, and a good example will be the ways in which we're yeah by using Dublin core it means we're massively lossy in that we have to bung stuff together um, in order to ca capture the, you know, they all use three different museum cataloging systems um, and export in different formats, in different ways. And, and modeling between those metadata is really, really challenging. Anyone who's ever worked in the kind of metadata federation will know. Um, and it will produce some kind of strange outcomes potentially. Um, but in order to make connections between the collections, we have to create those strange outcomes. And then we talk about the strange outcomes. And this is why, again, you know, I was very insistent when we designed this project that we would not launch a website on month 23 to your project. We would launch a website on month one um, because then we can collectively work through what that infrastructure means. We can all have logins and all play with it and all see what's going on. Um, and it doesn't come as a surprise for anyone. So building the archive is part of the, the practice of practical process of doing the work, which then feeds back into, I'm sure, some of the, the work that's going on 
um, in the cataloging of some of the redescription and some of the archival research we're doing on the provenance of that. Any other questions? Nothing from online, I presume? Yeah. Go ahead. I'm just intrigued, David. When you uh, gave your presentation, you sort of gave us two different kinds of, of artifact that you were sort of contemplating. One was a, a production of colonialism itself, a cartoon you know, made, made in Europe. But there are also artifacts that originate from colonial sources. And it strikes me that there's a different way in which you, we ought to be thinking about cataloging those items. And that suggests to me that when we're talking about um, an artifact which sits in the collection today, which originated from Kenya or Zimbabwe or something like that, it's pretty important that we actually ask a Kenya or a Zimbabwe and what do they think of that artifact. Because we don't necessarily have to do that when we're talking about a cartoon made in Belgium. How, so, do, how do you sort of you know, weigh up those differences in, in, in nuance? Because we're trying to remove a colonial nuance here, aren't we? And we don't want to replace it with a more anodyne, modern Western one. Yeah, no, I, I'm, not, I'm not inferring that we should have a kind of generic way in which we should scrub everything that's flat and anodyne. I think what I'm trying to get at is that as a historian, I'm, I'm starting through a ver various different encounters with different research areas to become really interested in some of the ways, the histories of, histories of knowledge organisation. So in one case, the ways in which Dorothy George produced a series of descriptions to a um, how they were situated. And on the other hand, um, through the Make Out Connections work, the ways in which three very different collections were, uh, and their ways of organising and describing them were produced. Um, and that fits into a wider thing I'm interested in, well, the fact that things are produced very differently. And going back to the point I made before, if we're sort of bunging stuff together, the differences in production suddenly become, they feel to me like they are, they are really important to tease out. Um, we know they are there. We know things are produced differently. We, we know that different labours go into different types of uh, cataloging work or description or whatever. Um, we know that these are different professional practices. Um, and I'm just really interested in sort of excavating some of that history and analysing it. And this is, for me, the very start of a process of, I have currently a couple of sort of case studies that I've come to through various means, but I'm starting to try and think about where else I should go, what other kind of collections I want to think about in terms of not just, um, not just to then think about how we catalogue things, but just to think about how those descriptions are structured. And I'm really interested in the kind of the structures through which um, collections have been organised and how those continue to resonate, how they stay out of place, how they remain, you know, they remain in our systems and keep, keep perpetuating them today and the ways in which that causes problems. In the case of Dorothy George, I don't think she's necessarily a problem. Um, if something suggests it, something suggests it, no. Um, but I think the, the way that she structures the way in which we organise our thoughts about Lake George historical prints is something that I'm actually quite interested to think about. Um, and I've not got there yet, but I want to look at that history in order to think about how it's produced. So thank you for the question. It's certainly not something I would like to do. Okay, a kind of boring flag and yes, more people contributing descriptions of things seems to be a good thing. Though, again, I'm not, I'm not an expert in the, the critical museology literature and the way in which museologists and, and museum professionals are currently talking about the ways in which you engage communities in description. I know of examples of collections where they have quite explicitly done that work. Um, but that's not my area of direct expertise. Well, thank you very much, James. And um, please join me in um, thanking James. <laughs> Before you all just disappeared, um, a couple of things. First of all, this is our last seminar um, for this academic year. So please keep an eye out for our new scheduled seminars. We've been discussing what potential ones we were going to have earlier this afternoon should be up over the summer um so please come back and visit and attend some other seminars come the autumn end of september october should be our first one second please come downstairs and enjoy a drink and carry on the conversation in a bit more of a